Do you remember that first moment as a child when something really inspired you for the first time? I'm talking about that first memory that comes to mind when you were intrigued and fascinated and excited all at the same time just because something really amazing existed in the world and you were just finding out about it. This is that moment for me. Growing up in the landlocked state of Kansas, the ocean quickly became an obsession of mine when I first learned about it. On the weekends, instead of watching cartoons, I was watching National Geographic or the Discovery Channel because I wanted to learn more about the ocean and its inhabitants. Each and every time I was asked what I wanted to be when I grew up, the answer was a marine biologist. And I came to the University of Miami in 2015 to do just that. Since, I've had some intimate and amazing experiences with the ocean that have pulled me even closer to the natural world. The summer after my freshman year, I didn't move home. I moved to Gloucester, Massachusetts to intern aboard a whale watch boat. Each and every day, I took pictures of whales for 12 hours, and when I wasn't performing these taxing responsibilities, I was teaching tourists on the boat about whales and how people influence ocean environments. I even got to teach little kids about whales from the inside of this life-size inflatable humpback named Salts. And something that we focused on when we were teaching little kids and tourists was plastic pollution, because it's something that heavily influences filter feeders in the ocean, such as humpback whales. So when I say filter feeders, I mean animals that don't eat one fish at a time. They eat several fish at a time, and they engulf all the water and anything else in the water surrounding them, which includes plastic sometimes. So one day we even stumbled upon this out on the boat, and coming upon it, I thought that we had discovered some prehistoric bird and we were all about to die. But as it turns out, it was just a pool floaty floating 30 miles offshore in the northern Atlantic, right next to feeding humpback whales. And as alarming as this was to the tourists on board, it became a common occurrence for us to stop and have to pick up marine debris. By the end of the summer, we had tallied that we'd seen nearly a 1,000 balloons floating in just one small space north of the Boston Harbor. So the whale watch boat is where I first learned about the phenomenon of plastic pollution, but it's a problem throughout the globe. When I was studying abroad at James Cook University in northern Australia, I was taking classes from some of the world's leading coral conservationists. And for those of you who are ocean savvy, you know that corals have a lot more to worry about than just plastic in the ocean. But plastic is a recurring theme at some of the world's biggest marine conferences. And this is because plastic in the ocean is everyone's problem. There's not just one country that's responsible for all of the plastic out in our ocean, and there's not one administration that can be responsible to clean it all up. So ocean science has yet to fully grasp how plastic is going to influence ocean and human health in upcoming years, which ocean and human health are delicately intertwined. There's three major ways that plastic pollution is going to influence public health, the first being microplastics. So as, ocean floats, or as plastic floats on top of the ocean, it breaks down and crumbles into microscopic versions of itself due to wave action and sunlight. And so these tiny microscopic particles are known as microplastics. And anything ranging from the smallest of plankton up to humpback whales can ingest this plastic and it gets stuck in their tissues. So the fish that we eat is not safe from this reality. So in the next five to 10 years, we could be eating plastic in the tissues of our fish. Secondly, as plastic breaks down on, a, on the land environment, it can leach harmful chemicals such as BPA, which is commonly found in the lining of our water bottles and Tupperwares, or PPDEs, which is a flame retardant that's commonly used in your cell phone, your laptop, and any of the electrical boxes in your house. So if these items, once we're done with them, aren't properly disposed of, they could end up leaching these chemicals, which are endocrine receptors, into our drinking water. Thirdly, as plastic makes its way to our beaches, it's squashing some of our most awesome tourist sites. And these people that rely heavily on the ocean for their entire livelihood and income, it could be hurting their economy throughout the globe. 
So one solution is just to quickly and quietly clean the ocean up and get rid of all the plastic that's already floating out there. But I believe that ocean cleanup efforts could be further hurting our ocean's ecosystems. If you were in a rowboat in the middle of a downpour and you had nothing but a bucket to scoop the water out of the bottom of your hole, you could work tirelessly. But if the rain didn't stop, then your boat would still sink. And this is how I view our plastic pollution problem. We're running out of time to stop the input of single-use plastics into our ocean. And to be fair, I don't even think that plastic in our ocean is the problem. Rather, I think it's a consequence of a larger problem at play, which is the way that we use and abuse single-use plastics in our everyday life. When you stop to consider the single-use plastics that you consume every day, you probably don't even think of many of them anymore. But everything ranging from all of your to-go containers, all of your hygienic products, all of your forks and knives that you use once, you use them for one hour at a time, and then they'll sit in a landfill for up to 450 years. Starbucks alone throws away four billion cups annually. And if you stacked all of these on top of one another, it would go all the way to the moon and back. So you might be thinking to yourself, I'm not contributing to this problem because I recycle all of my plastic. And don't get me wrong, I think recycling initiatives are great. But in reality, of the recyclable items that you put in a recycling bin, only about 40% actually make it back out onto the market. And of all the plastic manufactured throughout the globe, only about 6 to 9% are recycled. Now, I want to make it clear that I don't think that plastic is our enemy. In fact, my dad has been working in the plastics manufacturing industry for almost 30 years now. He's watching this talk today, but I don't think he'll be sharing it with his coworkers later. So again, I want to reiterate, plastic is an ingenious invention. It's not the enemy. Rather, the way that we use and consume single-use items is. So the ocean, my ocean that I've been desperately in love with since I was a little girl, is of need, it's in need of some changes from us. And so I decided to make some changes in my day-to-day -day life that would limit the amount of single-use pl plastics entering our landfills and therefore also our oceans if they're not properly disposed of. The first being single-use utensils. Everywhere I go, I bring my own set of utensils with me. If every University of Miami student did this and stopped using plastic forks at lunch, we would save 2,500 pounds of just plastic forks from entering a landfill every year. And that's just on one college campus. I do the same with a coffee mug. So everywhere I go, I bring a coffee mug with me. And what most people don't realize is that major coffee chains, such as Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts, they offer you a small discount when you bring your own mug. It doesn't even have to be a mug that you purchased from them. It can be any mug with any logo. They'll give you a discount. And so the average person that buys coffee at a shop every day would save about $130 a year just by making this one switch. So if the environmental incentives aren't enough, it's actually more economical to buy this way. Next, when I'm grocery shopping, I go beyond bringing my own canvas bag, and I also bring my own produce bags. So when I'm buying fruits and vegetables, or even dry goods, such as nuts and beans, I bring my own canvas bag, and if I don't need a bag at all, I just don't take it. So Whole Foods or Lucky's Markets, various chains throughout the US offer this. When I'm buying hygienic products, I skip everything that's liquid and comes in plastic, and I go for bar packaging, so rather lack of packaging. I try to get everything from my lotions to my shampoos outside of packaging, and Lush is one popular chain that offers this. And here in Miami, we have a local store called Verde Market where you can bring back old containers and refill them, and they'll sell you everything by weight. So here is where I can buy my spices, my oils, my dish detergents, my laundry detergents, etc. It's right here in Miami, and if you're not from Miami, they actually offer this at local co-ops throughout the US. And the most recent habit that I've adopted with the help of my roommates is to compost all of our food scraps. So 
Our compost bin, which we have aptly named Compost Malone, has saved us about 350 pounds of food waste from entering a landfill just this year in Miami. And you can compost anything from your fruit and vegetable scraps to pet hair, to your own fingernails, which is kind of gross, to tea bags and bread and pastas. You can all put in the compost bin and then this local company called Back to Earth will actually turn that back into soil and sell it back to local farmers in Miami. So you're saving all that waste from entering a landfill. So this style of living is commonly referred to as zero waste living, which is the practice of abstaining from consuming any goods that can neither be recycled or composted. So it's kind of like a diet, but instead of keeping from eating foods high in calories, you're trying to refuse as much plastic as possible. Now, I want to make it clear that there is no right or wrong way to live zero waste. When I started living zero waste a year ago, I cut plastic out cold turkey. I stopped consuming it entirely. I was making my own yogurt. I attempted to brew my own beer, which was a disaster. And I even pretended that coconut oil was a proper substitute for deodorant for one unfortunate summer. And I was making myself miserable. The choices that I was making to try to better the ocean were making me resentful because I was putting in too much work and not getting enough in return. If you want to make progress with your plastic consumption, you just have to start little by little. And I also want to make it clear that the changes that you make in your day-to-day -day life influence your friends and family and the community around you. And it really creates a domino effect. You guys would be surprised at how many people will come up to me and say, I bought a, or I bought a reusable straw just because I saw you doing it, and I knew I could do it too. I often go back and ponder on this picture of me as a little girl because I like to remind myself of where my passion for the ocean all began. And I know that my individual efforts to reduce my plastic waste might be small, I know that you change the world with your actions rather than just your opinion. So I like to think that I'm making the little girl in this picture proud. Thank you.